In the first part of the story about the history of radio, I talked about all types of radio receivers that were known at the end of the First World War. But he said nothing about another type of radio receiver, which was patented in 1918 and which has been the most popular type of analog radio for long-range radio reception for more than a hundred years. That is why it deserves a separate conversation, and it is a superheterodyne. The superheterodyne is based on the principle of converting the input signal with the frequency of the radio station into a fixed intermediate frequency, IF, signal, followed by its amplification. Thanks to this, the superheterodyne received a very significant advantage over other types of radio receivers in terms of significantly greater sensitivity and, especially, selectivity. The use of an auxiliary oscillation generator in the receiver was first proposed by the already known Regine and Fessenden in 1901 for his direct conversion receiver with a machine generator. He also created the term, heterodyne. In 1917, the French engineer Lucien Levy patented the principle of superheterodyne reception. In his receiver, the signal frequency was not converted directly into a sound one, but into an intermediate one, which was isolated on the oscillating circuit and after that was sent to the detector. The intermediate frequency amplifier was still missing. In 1918, the German Walter Schottky and the American Edwin Armstrong, already known to us for the invention of the regenerator, came up with the idea of supplementing the Levy circuit with an intermediate frequency amplifier independently of each other. Schottky applied for a patent in June, and Armstrong received a patent in December 1918, but Armstrong was the first to build and test a superheterodyne in practice, and that is why he is considered the father of the sepaheterodyne. A year later, Edwin Armstrong sold his patent, and therefore all the rights to the commercial production of the superheterodyne, to the RCA Corporation, which had just been created at the initiative of David Sarnov. For one million dollars, at that time it was a colossal amount. But Sarnov did not lose. Thanks to the monopoly right to Armstrong's patent, his company became the undisputed world leader for the next 10 years and very rarely sold the right to produce a superheterodyne to its competitors. The superheterodyne scheme was advantageous at that time also because the radio tubes of that time did not provide the necessary amplification at frequencies above several hundred kilohertz. By transferring the signal amplification function to the intermediate frequency amplifier in the lower frequency range, it was possible to increase the sensitivity of the receiver. In December 1921, an unknown English radio amateur on a superheterodyne with a five-stage intermediate frequency amplifier received signals from stations from the USA. From this moment, Practical interest appears in superheterodynes. The first superheterodynes were bulky, expensive and uneconomical due to the large number of radio tubes. The reception was accompanied by interference whistles, and due to the ability of the signal from the local oscillator to penetrate the antenna, it, like the regenerator, created obstacles for other receivers. For some time there was even a dilemma, which is better, a simpler, cheaper and more reliable regenerator or a complex, capricious, but highly sensitive superheterodyne that can work even with a small indoor antenna. This dilemma was solved with the appearance of multi-grid radio tubes, first tetrodes and pentodes, and then special converting tubes, octodes, heptodes and hectodes in the early 1930s. From this time, or to be precise, from 1932.33, the superheterodyne began its victorious triumphal march across all continents of the world, almost simultaneously displacing radio receivers of all other types from the US market. 
and during the next five years also on the market in Europe. It seems that they have finished with the theory of radio reception, which is of little interest to most people. But this short excursion was absolutely necessary for a better understanding of the essence of this ingenious invention. It's time to move on to the history of the practical use of radio and its triumphant development after the First World War. And, unfortunately, its quiet decline in our time. But about that in the next series.